So, so far I've talked about why there needs to be a retrograde transport pathway involving a COP1 vesicle. That we have these V snares, we have proteins escaping the ER that need to be dragged back. And so the question is, how do you recognize proteins that have escaped the ER and that need to be taken back to the ER? And so in many ways, this is the same problem. I, it pops up time and again in cell biology where you'll have things that end up in the wrong place and you have to have some sort of recognition machinery to resort them to make sure that everything, everything ends up in the right compartment all the time because no molecular process operates at 100% efficiency. And so I often refer to this general problem as the bounty hunter problem or when dog the bounty hunter was on, the dog the bounty hunter problem. Because any good bounty hunter has to do two things. One, needs to identify the target. So you need some way of tracking them down, and then once you've identified them, you need to capture and return to jail. And jail, for our purposes, is the endoplasmic reticulum. So what I'm going to focus on initially is how do you identify the target? How do you identify proteins that have escaped the ER but whose primary resonance is the endoplasmic reticulum? So the, the solution to this problem as with many things, are sorting signals. So resident ER proteins have addresses. And by addresses, I mean amino acid sequences. So what are these tags that allow proteins to be recognized as ER resident proteins? So there's two major classes, and they break down along the type of protein you're dealing with. So for ER membrane proteins, so what are ER membrane proteins? You can think of SRP receptor, the SEC61 channel, these are all proteins that are transmembrane proteins, but that stay in the ER, or at least they're supposed to stay in the ER. Now for those proteins, if you were to look at their sequences and you start looking at the amino terminus, what you find is that they're all very different until you get to the last four amino acids of the protein where you see the sequence KKXX. Now that doesn't seem like it has a lot of information because all it is is two lysines followed by any other amino acids you need. But these are the four amino acids that need to be at the C terminus. And what's more, for this sequence to work, this has to be on the cytoplasmic face. of the protein. So we'll go into why that has to work, but when we talk about what the capture and uh, the capture machinery is in the COP2 vesicle to return these membrane proteins back to the ER. But all you need to know is that if an ER membrane protein has a KKXX signal at the C-terminus, it's, it's likely a, uh, an ER resident protein. And of course, then this uh, ultimately has to be on the cytoplasmic phase. So what happens for ER soluble proteins? So what's an ER soluble protein? That would be something like BIP or other chaperones, the N-linked glycosylation machinery, a number of any one of a number of proteins that are in the ER lumen 
but aren't transmembrane proteins. These proteins are similar in that you have amino terminus most of the protein and at the C terminus you need the following amino acids K D E L. So in both cases the recognition the address information is at the C terminus but for a membrane protein and a soluble protein they're different sequences and it's important to keep those straight because they'll come up time and again in terms of how these different sorting machineries work. So how does this work? So as we said, you have a re you have a mechanism for you, what you have is identifying information. So if you were the bounty hunter, this would be height, weight, fingerprints, most likely phone GPS information, all the things that you would need to identify an individual as something you want to take back to jail. But in order to do that, you actually have to capture it. So if there's a sequence called the KDEL sequence, you know that there has to be a KDEL receptor, something that recognizes it and is involved in recruiting it into a COP1 vesicle and dragging it back to the ER. So I'll walk you through that because what we're going to do first is talk largely about soluble proteins. So ER soluble proteins and talk schematically about how the ER retention machinery works and then we'll talk about how that interfaces with the COP1 vesicle. So if you've got your favorite ER soluble protein that has a KDEL sequence at the C terminus and we combine that with the KDEL receptor which is drawn here which is a transmembrane protein. And we'll talk about why that's important when we talk about COP1 vesicles. So those two come together. I'll just draw it on the membrane. What you have is this interacting with In fact, I'm going to add another loop because that will come up important later. Um, so what you have is a receptor engaging with the sequence and binding to it. So how does this work in terms of the, the machinery? And first I'm going to give you the global view and then we'll go into the molecular de a little more molecular detail. So if you think of the ER on one side, and we've got the Golgi on the other side. And what's happening is this KDEL receptor is constantly circulating between the ER and Golgi, going forward with the COP2 vesicles and returning via the COP1 vesicles. And that raises a number of issues, and I'll walk you through those. So if you have the ER and you're built, budding off a COP2 vesicle, so you have the COP2 coat, and you have the KDEL receptor. All right. So at some point, there's going to be a protein with an ER retention signal, a KDEL sequence, that's going to leak into this. And I'm not going to write, the, I'm just going to write K for the moment because I don't have enough space to write the whole thing. But it gets in there. Now, obviously, when it's in the ER, we don't want it to bind to the KDEL receptor because if it did, the KDEL receptor would actually be binding it, recruiting it into the COP2 vesicle, and taking it away from the ER. So at this point in the in the in the ER the KDEL receptor is inactive. And you might say, well why why is that kept inactive? How do we know it's kept inactive at this point? The what's largely thought to happen is that 
the ER is higher pH. And what this means is lower affinity for the KDEL sequence. So what we have is a KDEL sequence containing protein that's leaked into this COP2 vesicle. We get anterior grade transport. And I'm going to skip all the vesicle coding, uncoding, fusion steps. And we're just going to get to the Golgi. And I won't finish drawing it, but what we have is this KDEL sequence containing protein leaked in and got in here. So we're now in the cis Golgi. What happens? How does how do we recognize this KDEL sequence via the KDEL receptor? and drag it back to the, to the ER. So what happens is that in the Golgi, in the cis Golgi, what is thought to happen is it exists at a slightly lower pH. And what that means is that the KDEL receptor has higher affinity. for the KDEL sequence. As a result, what ends up happening are two things. One is we're constantly making these COP1 vesicles, which we haven't talked anything about how they form yet, but they also have a coat just like COP2, different proteins, but the same basic idea. And that one of the things that that coat does is it concentrates the KDEL receptor. Now the difference between the beginning of anterior grade transport where the receptor can't bind KDEL and the beginning of COP1 is that the lower pH means that KDEL receptor has a higher affinity. And so any KDEL containing proteins where the KDEL sequence is at the C terminus, it's going to bind to them. And recruit them into the forming COP1 vesicle. So what you have is a leak in one direction and then cap recognition and capture, and it gets dragged back just the same way a bounty hunter would drag uh, the bail jumper back to court, drags it back to the ER. And so you have retrograde transport. So one of the things I want to point out while we're here, and I'll go through this in more detail, is, and I drew, so if you imagine, well, why does the KDEL receptor get concentrated in the COP1 coat? This actually gets back to the issue of what makes a transmembrane protein have to have that KKXX signal at the C-terminus. It turns out that that C-terminus I'm just going to draw it right here, binds a KKXX sequence there will bind the COP1 coat. So what you have is any transmembrane protein that leaks forward, if it has a KKXX sequence at the C-terminus on the cytoplasmic side, 
it has to be on the cytoplasmic side in order to work because what happens, it will bind to the COP1 coat proteins that are forming and get pulled into that nascent vesicle and get concentrated. So that same idea is what, how the KDEL receptor works. The KDEL receptor has a KKXX signal at its C terminus on the cytoplasmic side. So it gets pulled into the COP1 coat and it pulls anything that's got a KDEL sequence on it into that vesicle along with it. Now, this idea may seem similar because we've talked a little bit about this with COP2 in terms of how different proteins interact with SEC2324 in order to get concentrated, but the molecular details of that are pretty poorly understood. And that's why we spend a lot more time talking about the molecular details of COP1 and the recycling pathway to get things back to the ER. But that's the basic concept of if you want to concentrate something into a vesicle, at some point there has to be a transmembrane protein that interacts with the coat. And in this case, we understand what that is. It has to be a protein that has one of these KKXX signals in it. And for KDEL, uh, the soluble proteins, it interacts with a KDEL receptor that has one of those uh, sequences. So that gives you the overview of how the targeting sequences roughly work. And so now what I'm going to do is in the next screencast, walk you through how this COP1 vesicle assembles its coat. Because in many ways, it's, it's virtually identical with slightly different players of what goes on with COP2. So if you understand COP2, all you need to do is do a global search and replace and just change the names of everything. And you pretty much understand how COP1 vesicles work. But I'll walk you through that in the next screencast.